Hello and welcome to the 31st annual meeting of the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery. We're here with CTSNet. Here I have Michael Mack, Joe Sebik, and David Taggart, and we're here to discuss a bit about the venous, venous, venous grafts for cabbage. Uh, Michael Mack, please, could you tell us a bit where are we standing right now with the uh, cabbage grafts in the field of venous grafts? Well, uh, to me, nothing has changed over the last 40 years. Uh, the original studies done at the Cleveland Clinic showed that bilateral internal mammary arteries led to improved survival over a single internal mammary artery, but the use, <clears throat> at least in the United States, remains around 5%. The typical operation we do is a mammary artery and three or four saphenous vein grafts, and we've done nothing to improve them over the years, but there's a lot of things on the horizon. I think what we have to do is focus on how we make saphenous vein graft patency better because that's going to continue to be the operation that we do and fortunately there's some promising things on the horizon. And if you mention some promising things, what, what, what are you thinking of? What are the promising future prospects for the venous grafts? So I think there's, we've got uh, two experts in the field here and I would like to hear uh, uh, what they have to say, everything from no touch technique to uh, preservation solutions for saphenous vein grafts to what I think is incredibly exciting is external support. So, David, you've had some work with preservation of saphenous vein grafts, right? Yeah, so as Mike said, I think to put a sense of perspective of where we are today, we had 20 years of a lot of data suggesting that arterial grafts give better long-term results. But last year, there were around one million cabbages performed worldwide and 80% of every graft put in the heart was a vein graft. So that is where the practice is today, despite all the theoretical and angiographic benefits of arterial conduits. And I think what I would say is there are a number of issues with regards to vein grafts. And in the ART trial, our interim five-year analysis, we saw no difference between bilateral and single ITA. And almost certainly one of the reasons for that was extraordinarily high use of optimal medical therapy. 90% of patients on aspirin, statins, beta blockers. So before we do anything else with veins, I think we've got to make sure we've got medication right. The second thing is, as Mike's alluded to, what do you do when you harvest that vein graft? And there's increasing evidence that the storage solution is highly important to the subsequent longevity of that graft, as shown in a sub-study of Prevent4. Mm -hmm. And then there are three other potential interventions that can improve long-term patency of vein grafts. The no-touch harvest technique, and we can come back to that. Secondly is the work being done from Korea just now, the so-called Save Rita trial, where you anastomose a vein to the side of the mammary artery, and the patencies of those at one year are over 95%, presumably because the vein is benefiting from nitric oxide being eluted into that graft. And then the third thing I'm going to talk about, and here I have a conflict of interest because I do research sponsored by the company, is the use of an external stent for vein grafts. So at that point, I'll stop and... So that's my general view of where we are okay. now. Yes, very nice. Could you also comment on that? Sure, I think that the, you know, my, my two colleagues have outlined things very nicely, but it's really throughout the whole course of how we harvest vein grafts, how we prepare vein grafts, when they're implanted in the patient, and then, and then post-operative care. That's all going to influence vein graft patency and longevity. And we really haven't thought about it much. If we think about why vein grafts fail, the main reason is that we take something that is used to a low pressure and, and give it a high pressure or injure it when we're harvesting it that ends up with intimal injury, which then starts the cascade. We have platelet adherence, which leads to intimal hyperplasia, which is the precursor of atherosclerotic plaque. So when we harvest the vein, we have to harvest it atraumatically. When we prepare the vein, we can't expose it to high pressures by using a syringe and overfilling the vein. When we implant the vein in the patient, it's going to be exposed to arterial pressure, so we have opportunities with external stenting to prevent that distension, and how we do that is going to be probably some of the most exciting things that happen in coronary surgery over the next five years. And then as Dr. Taggett has talked about, we know that aspirin is very effective. There was the cascade trial which seemed to imply that maybe even stronger antiplatelet therapy may prevent intimal hyperplasia, but unfortunately it was an underpowered study, but very exciting. So I would say that we really need to 
think about how we use vein grafts and across the whole uh, course of the patient's care, we have to alter the way we treat them uh, to keep the grafts open. So Joe, uh, do you think endoscopic vein harvest is more traumatic than an open no-touch technique? So I think it depends on who's doing it. Um, you know, I think that often, you know, at least when I trained, they get the most junior resident to harvest the vein open. I have an excellent PA now who harvests endoscopic vein much less dramatically than I did open. So I think no matter how we harvest the vein, it is upon us to make sure that we do it non-traumatically. And you think using endoscopic techniques, we truly can harvest it non-traumatically? I, I do believe that, yes. Yes. And I think, as Joe said, it's absolutely crucial that whoever is harvesting the vein, open or endoscopically, is someone who's skilled and knows what they're doing and not a series of rotating junior doctors who practice for six months and then move off. I think the evidence is still out on the angiographic patency because there are numerous trials out there which show angiographic patency of vein grafts harvested endoscopically is inferior to open harvest. Now you could argue that is perhaps the earlier days of the endoscopic technique and those numbers will improve but there is a large trial underway that's almost completed enrollment that will give us a much better handle on that data. Yes, and what do you think of the so-called really no-touch technique so that you take the pedicle of the vein with the graft? What do you think about that technique? Well, I think that, you know, the very exciting thing I think about that, first of all, is again, we're taking the vein out atraumatically. And taking it with the pedicle then is kind of the external stenting. <laughs> and so the vein doesn't get uh, distended. And that's very promising, at least in terms of the theoretical about the way we think about how we should harvest veins and how veins should be implanted. The problem is, is the leg complications and the infections. And it's very hard, I think, to go backwards yes. and to say we're going to do a maximally invasive thing to a patient's legs when we know that that is probably a lot more morbid than the sternal wound incision. So it'd be really wonderful if we can think about a way to uh, minimally invasively harvest a pedicle vein graft. Would be maybe very that's nice. the future. Yes. And I think just to reinforce what Joe's saying about that technique, so the long-term angiographic patency with it is excellent. And whether that's because of the interaction of cytokines in the periadventitial flat with it, in the periadventitial fat with the endothelium, mm -hmm. whether it's even possible that the fat is acting as a mechanical support, we do, we're not sure. But if you consider that up to 40% of patients are diabetic, then it makes these potential for leg wound complications a really significant problem. Yes, of course. And what you talked about earlier, it's not only about preparing the patient, har harvesting the vein by uh, experienced uh, personnel, but also about maintenance of the graft patency afterwards. So a, a, sp a specific role for a cardiologist, for a general practitioner, to keep the patient active on the right medication. What do you think about that, about statins, for instance? Uh, it's very important. I think when you look at the trials, the lower uh, the LDL, the better. Uh, you know, preferably under 70 if you can. Uh, help the vein grafts uh, stay open longer. And we've talked about antiplatelet agents. All those things are, are very important. Yes. And um, about... Uh, you see also with the maintenance with the drugs with the graft pates, you can see that the graft pates sometimes increases a bit when you are th they are on long time drugs, right? So when do you th think the trials of these uh, effects will be clearly visible? So, so I think that what we have seen in all the randomized trials is that medical therapy has been unbalanced afterwards. Uh, uh, patients receiving PCI always have more intensive medical therapy and dual antiplatelet therapy. Mm. And you can, in, you can infer from that uh, that if we had more aggressive medical therapy and from the evidence that Joe just mentioned that the patency of saphenous vein grafts you know, would be better. I think the evidence that dual antiplatelet therapy in vein grafts uh, is not nearly as strong as it is in PCI, mm -hmm. but I think that should be our default strategy unless there are contraindications yes. uh, to a patient yeah. uh, receiving them. Yeah, and just one step back, so we're talking about saphenous grafts, uh, of course, but why do you think the, the, the percentage of saphenous grafts is still so high while well, every trial actually shows that a beta is preferable? Why do you think it is? Is it... Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, so I think I think two things. You know, one is it, it technically is more difficult uh, to do bilateral internal mammary um, arteries and to get them to reach to.
to where you want to do. And it takes some surgeons out of their comfort zone. Secondly, there's such a focus on coronary bypass mortality and public reporting of outcomes that surgeons are reluctant to do anything more complex than what they're doing uh, because they have good outcomes and they don't want to do anything to mess that up. I mean, David, what are your mm. thoughts? So I, I, I agree completely. And of course, we as surgeons are only judged on short-term outcomes. We are not judged on 10 year survival. So there is no incentive in the system for us to be using more arterial grafts, particularly when we work in a system that is potentially punitive if you're seen to have an early increase in complications. Yes. Do you have any? You know, I think also that when people think about coronary surgery, they think it's surgery that everyone should do. I would argue that coronary surgery has specialized or myocardial revascularization has reached the point where we have medicines, we have intervention, and we have surgery, we have arterial grafts, that I really think we need to start thinking of coronary surgery with coronary specialists, coronary surgical specialists who are willing to take the time uh, to learn the new techniques, to spend more time in the operating room and do more arterial grafting. It is the focus of their career, just like we might say for a mitral valve repair surgeon Technique. or an aortic surgeon. Yes. We haven't reached that point yet. And to me, not until we reach that point are we gonna really see a shift. Because really what we are about is, is doing what's best for our patients, and that's just not the short term. It is the long term. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more about that. The, yeah. I, I think we, and I'll take a lot of blame for this, uh, have been part of the leadership of cardiac surgery that has always treated cabbage as a generalist procedure. Everybody does it. And I think we have done a huge disservice to our patients and our specialty uh, uh, by doing that. If you really think about it, what is the most technically demanding operation we do in cardiac surgery? It's not a mitral valve repair. It's not an aortic valve replacement. It's coronary bypass surgery. Surgery, yeah. Why do we think uh, cardiologists are so successful in what they do? Well, one of the reasons is they have interventional coronary specialists. And I think we're, it's way past time for us to not go down that route. I mean, we need coronary interventionalists, and it needs to be as, um, as uh, uh, much a pro high as a profile and as sexy as mitral valve repair surgeons are. You know, an another opportunity to improve uh, vein graft uh, patency is during uh, preparation and storage. You know, after the vein is harvested, the, the veins are, uh, the, the vein branches are, are ligated and it's very easy to over distend the vein and injure it then. And also the solution that one uses is very important. We've learned that normal saline in blood is not appropriate. Blood will become alkaline as the CO2 leaves it and that can be very injurious. Uh, to the intima of the vein, and uh, normal saline is not pH balanced. So we really need to use pH balanced or, or buffered solutions in the storage of our veins. Okay. You have anything to add to the to the st yeah the storage of the veins? Um, no, no. I I, I think that's <coughs> I, th I think Joe's covered that. Okay. You want to talk about stenting? Yeah. Okay. So. so, 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 so if you want, I'll say a bit about external stenting. And I do, again, preface this by saying I do have some conflicts of interest mm -hmm. because I have research funded by one of these e external stent companies. So the concept of stenting veins is not, external stenting of veins is not new. It was described in 1963 by Parsonet. But the initial results in all the clinical trials to date have been, one could say, pretty disastrous, with the exception of the stent that I'm currently using, which is called the VEST device. And in our preliminary trials five years ago, we had initial patency rates of about 70%. With our learning techniques and improving what we're doing, those are now over 90% at six months to a year. And most excitingly, we have just submitted our five-year outcome data, albeit on a small group of patients. Mm -hmm. And what we describe is in 21 patients who agreed to come back for angiography and IVIS at five years, who had perfect stent patency at one year, at five years, they remain perfectly patent, no deterioration at all in these veins. And hopefully, what we would like to see happen is that that occurs out to 10 years. Now, we have also completed a trial, 180 patient randomized trial in three centers. Uh, I'm sorry, in 10 centers in Europe. And Mike, I think I understand you're thinking of conducting a, another trial in the United States? Yeah, we're actually starting it right now. It's called the VEST trial. Uh, it's uh, about 400 patients uh, that are going to be randomized between uh, uh, a, a externally supported vein graft 
and one without. So the patient's going to serve as their own control. Uh, one vein uh, will get the, the, the support. This is, everybody's going to get a Lima to LAD. And then yeah. the CERC and right, one will be randomized to uh, a s external support. The other will not get external support. Uh, this is being done through what's called the uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery Trials Network, uh, which is funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, in the United States. Uh, there are, there's 37 centers in the network. I believe 25 of those will be doing this trial. And to me, this is the most exciting thing I've heard in bypass surgery uh, in a long period of time. Hmm. I mean, is it too simplistic to say, David, that functionally you're turning a vein into an artery and therefore... Um, having the long-term patency of an artery, if it is, to me, that's a game changer. I think essentially it is what we're doing. And I come back to this point that Mike said when he was president of the STS that everything we do as surgeons make our lives more difficult. Small incisions, robotics, off-pump. But this is the first device I've seen in cardiac surgery in my career that actually makes our job potentially easier. It takes a minute to do, so you don't need to be an expert technical surgeon to do this. And if I made the prediction now, I think this will be the biggest game changer in coronary surgery in the next five years, because despite all our enormous circumstantial evidence in favor of arterial grafts, it hasn't moved us forward. But I think with this device, it is something that's very easy to do and can potentially change. And I, up to one year, I was very hesitant about how successful this would be, both in terms of one year outcomes and longer term outcomes. We now know our one year outcomes, our patency is well in excess of 90%. And the fact that we're now seeing those maintained through to five years, I think is very encouraging. Do you very share that enthusiasm, Joe? Yes, I do, because I mean, I, I think again, we have those multiple steps in, in harvesting the vein, preparing the vein, and then when it is exposed to arterial pressure. And I think what we're doing, it, it, see, I, I'd love to know if you agree, is that when we put this external stent on, we're now exposing the vein to an arterial pressure, but it's not becoming injurious because the vein does not distend. And so the intima stays intact, and so all of that cascade of events that leads to the atherosclerotic plaque are eliminated. Mm. Uh, I think it's very exciting. And one, one other pathophysiological thing about the stents, which I find very interesting, which we published in JTCVS, if you do computational flow dynamics, it completely changes the nature of that flow it makes it far more laminar and eliminates turbulence. So we sh showed that by having far more laminar flow, you reduce areas of intima intimal hyperplasia. Yes. So uh, I, I'll stop on that point, but, but I do think it's exciting. So let me ask you one last question, David. There was another external support a few years ago um, that was not successful. Any insight into why that wasn't successful and this one maybe? So the, so the, the one that was unsuccessful was called the eMesh. Kip Spay. And the problem was that when they repeated angiography at nine months, they had a very high failure rate, but what they couldn't tell was actually the timing of the failure of those graphs or the nature of it. So it was a binary thing. They were either open or closed, and their patencies at one year were about 25%, whereas ours are 90%. So there is clearly a fundamental difference. But those results for Kip Spay were bad for the whole area because as soon as people heard the names external stent, they said, they backed off mm. very understandably. So yeah, I I'm, think gu I'm guilty of that too. No, 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 I, I was negative about this to begin no, with. No, but it's a completely natural phenomenon. And the only reason I didn't was because I was involved in a device. So I had a, a better understanding of this than people who weren't involved directly in the area. But for this to work well, it's not in anyone's interest for any company to do badly. So right. we were very disappointed at the Kips Bay results because as I say, I, I would say that set back this whole area by a full two years. I would totally agree. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for being here. And we're looking forward to the future perspective of the grafts. Well, thank this you. was a great session and thank you for asking me to participate. Thank you. And thank you for doing it at such short notice. Thank <laughs> you. <Patrick. laughs> thank you very much, well done. Thank you.